thank you, Bill, for that uh, kind introduction. I'm going to talk for uh, about 40 minutes and without slides. Uh, but before I get going, I thought maybe we could um, invite a little bit of thought from the whole group. Uh, and I will use a couple of slides to do that. Uh, so here is, a, um, here is a survey that was done by a US newspaper. And people were asked, do you have a great deal of confidence in certain sectors of society? So let's duplicate this survey uh, right now. Please raise your hands if you have a great deal of confidence in your political leaders. Oh my, <laughs> you are still asleep. Okay, if you have a great deal of confidence in your business sector leaders, please raise your hand. Okay, that's 3%. If you have a great deal of confidence in your education sector leaders, please raise your hand. Yes. <laughs> when I do this uh, survey with a business group, guess how they're voting. <laughs> If you have a great deal of confidence in your religious leaders, please raise your hand. Now all the Jesuits, please leave, and then we, <laughs> we vote again. Okay, so uh, on the first categories, we're deeply pessimistic about our leadership. We are here in the United States, the country of optimists. So I show you what is the actual results of this survey. And look, this was 2007 when things were still good. So we can imagine today. OK, so we are very disappointed in the quality of our leadership. What would be better? Let me invite you to do some 20 seconds of quiet reflection. Please think of the names of one or two living people you would consider to be leaders. And then why? What qualities, what attributes do you associate with being a good leader? And please think quietly for 15 seconds about these questions. With the Ignatian group, we can be quiet together. Uh, OK, so why don't you share with one or two people nearby the names and ideas you came up with. Then I will get your attention, and then I will speak. So who are our leaders? I'm sure people thought of wonderful names. I wonder who thought about their own name. I guess nobody, almost nobody. Or if you thought of your own name, probably you did not turn to someone else and say, no. <laughs> We are uh, raised in a culture that teaches us to be modest people. And modesty is a beautiful virtue. And after all, Ignatius devotes an important spiritual exercise to three degrees of humility. And at one moment, he said, there is no doubt that God will never be far from us, provided that he finds in us the humility which makes us worthy of his gifts. But even though humility is a beautiful virtue, when it comes to leadership, your humility maybe is misplaced because it comes from a broken idea, a mistaken idea of what is leadership. By stereotype, we associate leadership only with being in charge. So leaders means president, general, chief executive. Uh, we think of leaders as people who are famous, rich, celebrities, often obsessed with honor or status, the very opposite of humility. So of course, it would be immodest to think of ourselves as leaders. But this idea uh, that leadership is only for people in charge is not the solution to any problems, uh, whether in politics, in civic life, in religious life, at uh, Xavier in Kathmandu, at Loyola in Abuja, at St. Joseph's in Darjeeling. In fact, this notion is part of the problem. And somehow, the first people we must think about as leaders are ourselves, and I will explain why. Now, what do good leaders do to motivate the people around them? This was the other part of the mental experiment, and people thought of wonderful ideas like decisiveness and honor and courage. I wonder if anyone 
thought about this idea uh, articulated by someone with a wonderful leadership credentials. He said this, quote, you must love those you lead before you can be an effective leader. I just quoted General Eric Shinseki, who until a few years ago was the highest ranking military officer in the United States. And when I first heard this quote, it struck me as strange. Coming from a military class that we typically associate with macho, being tough. Or maybe not out of place, because the more I thought about it, the more I suspect that generals are making better choices. If they love the people, they must place in difficulty. And I also bet that soldiers perform better if they believe they are valued in a deep way by the people who have the horrible job of sending them to face their death. So who is a leader and how do we lead? Well, we're all leading, well or poorly. And our claim to leadership is not our status. Rather, the kinds of values that we are willing to role model in our life and work. Now, this idea does not fit our stereotype, but this is not a gimmick. If you look in a dictionary, you will always find various definitions of leadership, always including this one. Quote, to point out a way, direction, or goal, and to influence others toward it. Isn't it true? that everyone in this room is doing these words all the time. Mm -hmm. You are pointing out a way, a direction, by virtue of how you treat your colleagues, how hard you work, what you do with your money. Uh, all, of us have, all of us have parents, and many of us here are parents. Could there be any more obvious example of pointing out a way and influencing others than what parents are doing for children in a lifetime. So by the dictionary definition, not some gimmick from me, good parenting is good leadership. Think of your schools, the way the faculty treats each other, uh, the way the, their behaviors, their role modeling are the most powerful example that young people will ever receive of how adults ought to treat each other in the workplace. Uh, your Jesuit uh, colleague, Father now St. Alberto Hurtado, put my idea this way, quote, in order to teach, it is enough to know something, but to educate, one must be something. True education consists in giving oneself as a living model an authentic lesson, end quote. Okay, this is leadership pointing out a way for others. Now, before I go on, the uh, speed is okay for people listening in English? Okay, and for the translator in Spanish, it's also okay? Okay, great. Um, now, though all of us are leading, uh, most of us are doing so only subconsciously. In other words, we do not think about ourselves as leaders, and to get better, uh, we must become more explicit. Uh, what kind of statement will I make with my life? This whole conference is about leadership. Uh, the conference announcement says that, quote, the leaders of the Global Secondary School Network will gather uh, in order to discuss how Jesuit school educators can prepare students to become global leaders. And Father General's letter uh, described the conference as, quote, an opportunity to advance the society's commitment to form leaders who can serve both the church and the world. So this is my first and most important message to you. Be leaders and form leaders. This is part of your job. Uh, and leadership formation does not happen by magic. Uh, rather, we must, the same way that we discuss how to teach mathematics well, how to do campus ministry well, we must also discuss how are we forming leaders here at Bellarmine Prep, at Colegio San Ignacio, and so on. What are we doing? Is it working? And why talk about leadership? Simply because the 21st century presents us an incredible range of problems and opportunities. Uh, changes in technology, globalization, 
challenges to mission and identity. And great leadership is needed any time you must deal with change and challenge. And let me remind you that your predecessors, the first Jesuit generation, also coped with incredible change. Just think, in the lifetime of Ignatius and Francis Xavier, the globe as Europeans understood it uh, tripled in scale. Europeans encountered completely new cultures, languages, and traditions. Uh, history's uh, first mass media revolution was getting underway as the printing press proliferated and Protestant reformers used this new te media technology to confront the Catholic Church with its most dramatic challenge in ages. Though much was changing during Ignatius' time, not everything was changing. The overwhelming majority of the world's people were poor and had absolutely no access to secondary education. Less than 1% of uh, persons had the wonderful advantage that everyone in this room has had to have a higher education. Now, how did your predecessors react to this changing world? As I describe their generation's leadership initiatives, I hope you will understand that I am also speaking to your generation by analogy. So the founding Jesuit generation pioneered a completely new model of schooling, making education available at a level of quality that was never before available, and at a level of accessibility that was never before available. They understood that no one Jesuit school or province could by itself figure out every best practice. And so, because they felt themselves part of a universal body with a universal mission, they freely exchanged their very best ideas uh, with letters all around the network, and eventually they codified the very best ideas into a ratio studiorum, uh, so that every school uh, could easily profit from the best ideas coming from the other schools. They shared resources, personnel and financial resources that were plentiful in developed countries were transferred to the emerging countries. You heard that? <laughs> okay. Uh, they used new media technologies uh, in order to prepare catechisms and uh, books to help the Catholic Church support itself at an incredibly difficult era. They traveled to frontiers among the first Europeans to engage new cultures and learn new languages. Did they do everything perfectly? Of course not. For certain, from our 21st century perspective, some of their approaches would appear colonialistic and condescending to their host cultures. But when considered against the mentality of their age, most historians judge them far more enlightened than their contemporaries. Well, my brothers and sisters, your generation is faced with your own version now of every one of these challenges. And now is your moment to be similarly enlightened, pioneering, and innovative uh, for reasons in the great mystery of God that none of us would ever understand. This year is the team that the Holy Spirit has chosen to put on the playing field in this moment of history. And so five generations from now, when the ICJSE meets in Madagascar or Mumbai, what will they be saying about your generation, five centuries who came before? Let me start with the nightmare, what I am sure they will not be saying. Well, the world was globalizing rapidly in the early 21st century, and even though Jesuit schools had inherited an utterly unmatched global network, somehow they never quite figured out how to capitalize it, uh, capitalize on it in dramatic ways, and truly revolutionize how they did education. 
and 21st century culture value money and self-interested success, and their excellent schools graduated many who use their gifts effectively to achieve self-interested financial success. But not all of these people also use their gifts and talents to benefit the world's poor. Here instead is what they will say about you. They were worthy successors to the first generation. They used technology in incredibly innovative ways uh, in order to make education more accessible uh, and to raise its quality. Uh, in a uh, deeply secular society, they somehow figured out how to form graduates of deeply committed faith who helped the church in struggles to revitalize itself. And their graduates formed a global network to help the world eradicate poverty in their time. And maybe most remarkable, in the US Jesuit schools, they would say, they graduated excellent soccer players that helped the United States defeat España y Brazil. <laughs> I am confident they will say these things because you inherit a culture of Jesuit style leadership that will help you conquer even daunting challenges. You can thrive if you can instill in every student, staff, and faculty the leadership culture that your founders created. And I want to talk about three elements of that culture. Uh, one, the gift of heroic majus. Uh, two, the gift of ingenuity achieved through Ignatian indifference. And third, the gift of love. So first, the gift of heroic majus. And let me start with an anecdote. When the Jesuit school system was beginning in the 16th century, frankly, it must have been terrible. These guys had never run anything. They could not possibly have known how to run a school. And anyway, one early Jesuit is nonetheless so bold as to write a letter to the king of Spain and describe these pathetic little schools as something so important that, quote, the well-being of the whole world and all Christendom depends on it. <laughs> Sounds like a Jesuit talking, yeah? <laughs> but on the other hand, totally grounded in reality. Because in another place, writing a letter to one of his Jesuit buddies, listen to what this very same guy has to say about what it feels like to teach kids all day. Quote, it's a repulsive, annoying, and burdensome thing. <laughs> to guide and teach and try to control a crowd of young people who are naturally so frivolous, so restless, so talkative, and so unwilling to work that even their parents will not keep them at home. <laughs> I think this guy, in a way, has given us a beautiful model of heroism. The idea that, on the one hand, we must deal with reality. What is a problem, we must identify as a problem. We are fully aware of the day-to-day -day headaches of running a school, from broken plumbing, to too much bureaucracy, to not enough money. But on the other hand, we manage to, to hang on to our vision. This is why we're here. This is what we accomplish when we all do this well together. We Christians can understand this as an incarnational model of heroism. In other words, that we are somehow imitating this Jesus who arrives in a very complicated world and manages to remain committed to his vision of how human beings can treat each other. Above all, heroic magis means a deep sense of purpose greater than self. Uh, there is an anecdote about uh, President Kennedy of the United States when Russia and uh, the U.S. were racing to get a rocket to the moon. And the story goes, he visits the space agency. And at one moment, he meets a janitor who is cleaning an office. And to be polite, he says, okay, so what is your job here? And the janitor says to him, uh, Mr. President, I am putting a man on the moon. 
okay, I'm from New York City, we don't care about this uh, team spirit, you know? <laughs> but even I know, and everyone here knows, that the teams that perform best, whether it's my old J.P. Morgan, the Jesuits, the CCs of Canisius in Jakarta, Los Lobos of Instituto de Ciencias, the teams that perform best are teams where people, if I can use some American slang, get over themselves and appreciate this is not all about you. It's not all about being the librarian, the rector, the fundraiser. Rather, any team succeeds only when individuals understand and accept they are part of some mission, some project that is bigger than themselves, and they are willing to devote some of their energy and time uh, to this mission bigger than themselves. Uh, and so, uh, where does the madness lead me? In, not only in terms of my school, but rather in terms of something bigger, the lives of my students more broadly, the needs of our communities, as served by other Jesuit apostolates and the church. The needs of my brothers and sisters completely on the other end of the world. My just thinking means that we are willing to attack in a real way, not just a rhetorical way, what Father General uh, said in his letter uh, about this conference, namely, uh, that we can begin to establish ways of collectively preparing our students and communities to address the joys and hopes, the griefs and anxieties of the people of the present age, especially those who are poor and in any way afflicted. Once people begin to think of their, of their work this way, this is a leadership mentality. Uh, they are seeing themselves as helping to role model and achieve a vision much larger than themselves. Listen to how one of the very early Jesuits uh, a man teaching a few poor children in a temporary school on the coast of Brazil, listen to how he described his work. Quote, we are working to lay the foundations of houses which will last as long as the world endures. Imagine the impact if every one of our teachers and staff imagined their job in these kinds of terms. So the first challenge is to instill this spirit of Majis, but the next challenge is then to get, in fact, results, which requires a spirit of ingenuity, which comes from Ignatian indifference. Uh, that is, uh, we become open uh, to ingenuity, to getting results, when we are free to any kinds of inner resistances that might hold us back from attacking our goals, even ambitious, even adventurous, even risky. Any one of us here, in five minutes, could think of many interesting things that this global network could attempt. I will start the list with good ideas and bad ideas. Uh, students in the North and South uh, could begin exchanging language lessons, Spanish and English. Students could form international prayer circles. Uh, a multinational team of students could make interesting studies of the effects of immigration and migration in their society. We could publish online journals featuring the very best essays uh, from our students each year. Uh, students could set up an online uh, fundraising site in order to raise money uh, for some of the society's projects serving the very poor. That's about six. When everyone else here has six, we will have about 2,600 ideas. A few of them will be bad. Some of them will be absolutely fantastic. But even with the fantastic ideas, when they are first suggested, someone will begin to say these kinds of things. We tried to do that a decade ago. It didn't work. <laughs> uh, we cannot do that one because this school is uh, in charge. Maybe it would be better if we were in charge. Uh, let's study this idea for two or three years. Uh, maybe that won't work. How can we try it? It might fail. This is not the spirit of ingenuity, of ignition and indifference. 
We have schools here that are named for fathers Ricci, Xavier, Kleber, De Nobili, De Smet. If these men had listened to such thinking, uh, they never would have attempted the remarkable things for which you have honored them with the name of your schools. Rather, their only standard was the standard of Majus. Is this a smart idea that may serve God's greater glory? If it is, fine. We banish all attachments to our own ego, to our status, to our own particular school, our province, our country, to our fear of failure, uh, to the fear of looking foolish. We make ourselves free, internally free, uh, in order to attack good ideas by saying, okay, why not? Our willingness to make ourselves free flows from the third gift of Jesuit leadership culture, the attitude of love. We do not evaluate things with the eyes of the world, which tells us to gather and cling to our own power and advantage. Rather, we look through the eyes of love. Uh, we have received many gifts, and our response, as in the contemplation to attain love, is that we want to give gifts back, that's all. Ignatius told his colleagues that love ought to manifest itself in deeds, not in words. And those deeds, of course, begin with the children with whom you are entrusted, including the ones that are the most annoying, the outcasts, the misbehaviors, the one from terrible situations, the one who have no resources. Listen to what Father Nadal, uh, listen to how he once described part of the mission of the society, quote, the care of those souls for whom either there is nobody to care, or if somebody ought to care, the care is negligent. This is the reason for the founding of the society. This is its strength. This is its dignity in the church. Everyone here knows, you more than anyone, that children learn better when they feel safe and when people make them know that they are valuable and when they are raised in environments that have discipline. <coughs> and how did we convince ourselves that our adult needs, the needs of the parental community, the needs of your staff, somehow are different? The best teams I was on in J.P. Morgan were teams where we trusted each other. Uh, we uh, were more interested in, watch, in helping each other win than watch each other fail. We did not stab each other in the back, and we held each other very accountable to high standards so that each person and the whole team would perform well. We should think about the very notion of uh, being a company, a compañía, uh, you know that when the Jesuits founded their organization, they called themselves a company, Compañía de Jesús. Yeah? And we understand what is a company. The word for with or together, con, con in Spanish, and the word for bread, pan or panis. So what is a company? Etymologically, your company was, is, the group of people with whom you break bread the group of people who gives you energy. For us Catholics, of course, this uh, etymological idea of company has deeply Eucharistic overtones as well. The word companion, compañero, is exactly the same word. And these first Jesuits, of course, understood themselves first as compañeros of Jesus, but also compañeros of each other. And now the challenge is can we recreate this deep meaning and spirit of compañía uh, in the environment we now have in your schools in the 21st century? Maybe it was easier for the first generations to feel compañía. Uh, after all, the schools were smaller. All the teachers were Jesuits. The superior directly owned and ran the school. Uh, today, Many of you work in separately incorporated, even state institutions. The great majority of the faculty and staff are lay people. The great challenge may be uh, that we find ways to create still 
a deep spirit of compañía in this kind of situation. Um, so that as a result, uh, the, way that, uh, the, the way that we show our unity is not simply that we all repeat the same slogan, like Cora Personalis, or Men and Women for Others, but that we can work together in meaningful ways to get real results. What will happen when we leave this conference? I can assure you that there is not a team of 50 Jesuits in Rome waiting to prepare a master plan and implement these ideas. Many of these ideas will float away into the air. Unless a new compañía, a virtual compañía, small groups of people, someone in Boston, someone else in Pune, someone else in Nairobi, say, okay, that was a good idea, let's do something. I am not a Jesuit, so I can give you the corporate model, which is, it is easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. <laughs> do not worry about obedience. If there's a good idea, just do it. <laughs> the Jesuit can come up and say, no, 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 we don't want that. Um, if we have good ideas, we attack them, and if we get results, others will follow. Please do not wait. Um, now, the first Jesuits, uh, I, I've spoken about leadership so far using mostly secular language. But Jesuit-style leadership, of course, is fundamentally spiritual, grounded in Jesus. If God's spirit is not the inspiration, you will never be heroic, ingenious, or loving enough in the ways I describe. The first Jesuits, as their motto, had ite inflamate omnia, go and set the world aflame. And they lived this way only because they themselves were set aflame. They were ingenious and free only because they had found the pearl of great price. And they knew that status, greed, ego, possessions meant nothing in comparison to this pearl. And they were loving because they had felt themselves loved. They attained these gifts through deep self-awareness that comes from the spiritual exercises and by reminding themselves every day of their lives, of these, uh, of these ideas through the exam. Your Jesuit style leadership will only take root if you are also finding ways to instill in students and staff these very same values uh, through retreat experiences, through exercises in everyday life, through CLC, through daily practices like the exam and so on. In my last few minutes, let me uh, leave you with three uh, challenges. Be Christ, be accountable, be innovators. Uh, be Christ. Father Steve uh, Duffy uh, taught me in my freshman year in high school part of his 50 plus years teaching, and he was a deep and wonderful role model in my life. And I never understood the secret of his success until he wrote an essay after he retired describing how he understood his work. He said this, quote, I see myself radiating Christ to my students at all times. I do this by my concern and love and respect for them. I do it by being friendly in my dealings with them. I think of Jesus traveling with his companions, being with them 24 hours a day, and always having an effect on them in the way he dealt with them. Remember the definition of leadership I use, point out a way, influence others. This guy never used the word leadership, but he was showing leadership. He was being Christ. And of course, we have many uh, teachers in many of our countries uh, who may not believe in, uh, in, in the divine nature of Jesus as we know him, but they can still embody uh, the characteristics of this person. Second, be accountable. Are you holding yourselves accountable to your highest aspirations? Uh, the websites of almost every high school here very prominently features the idea that you are in the business of, quote, developing men and women for others. 
And more recently, uh, Father Kolbenbach said, quote, the real measure of our schools lies in who our students become. Well, who are your students becoming? How many men and women for others are you developing? Are you successful at it? Every Jesuit high school in the United States knows exactly what percentage of the graduating class of 1980 or 1985 or 1990 gave money to the high school last year. I suspect there is no Jesuit school anywhere in the world that knows what percent of the graduating class of 1980, 85, or 90 are men and women for others. Uh, of course, it is difficult to measure. But the only way to transform idealistic aspirations into reality is to hold yourself accountable to them. Start by discussing among yourselves what would you expect a 40 or 50 year old man or woman for others to look like? What would they do? How would they live? And then maybe ask us, ask us alumni, survey us. What do we think? How do we think we are living? You may be pleasantly surprised by what you hear, uh, but in any case, you will never know how successful you are until you try to measure. <coughs> Third challenge, be innovators. Two Stanford professors once observed that highly successful companies were characterized by the ability to preserve the core and stimulate progress. Another interesting way of describing the jobs of you administrators, preserve the core, maintain those essentials that define you as Jesuit, as Catholic, as a high school, that are so fundamental things that we never put on the table to change. But on the other hand, stimulate progress. Be willing to put everything else on the table to change. Um, what could be better? What should we try? Be open to taking risks. Will you fail sometimes? Of course you will fail. One of my managers at J.P. Morgan used to say, if we do not have enough failures, it only indicates to me you are not taking enough risks. <coughs> At least 25 <coughs> institutions here are named for St. Francis Xavier. Uh, think of the incredible level of personal risk that this man undertook. A tidal wave of change is washing over the world, and now is not the time for us to hang back, a little unsure and a little afraid. Now is the time to honor this great saint and other heroes like Ricci, Di Nobili, Hurtado, uh, Father Velas, and others by taking the innovations that will sustain our network and heroic modules into the future. Uh, before I finish, let me say something else. Uh, most of us are adults. By the time we understand how much our teachers have done for us and how important our teachers have been in our lives, by then, life has moved on, and we are too far uh, away in our lives to say thank you. Uh, I don't know how many students were individually taught by the people in this room. I did a quick calculation. I guess at least 500,000, 600,000. They're not here, but I am here. Uh, and on their behalf, and on my own behalf, uh, I just want to say, uh, thank you for the deeply profound influence that you made <coughs> in our lives. Um, every pundit I know of, where they talk about business, politics, social life, they talk about the need of great leadership. Think of the list of challenges uh, Father Danny Huang mentioned. Uh, think of the incredible pace of technological change. Think of the challenges the church finds. Uh, think of the complexities of navigating with different cultures. Uh, we have a terribly complex, difficult landscape in the early 21st century. This is a moment for leadership, so this is your moment. And thanks be to God, the Jesuit culture gives you enormous resources and gifts if we use them to be able to tackle these challenges. Remember, I, at the beginning of my talk, we all thought of the names of one or two leaders. Now I finish. 
but I remind us of this exercise, and I hope that now you think of your own name first, and you think of your students, and your staff, and your faculty, when I say that we need smart, competent, and virtuous people who are willing to step up in a world that in some ways is deeply beautiful, but in other ways is deeply suffering. And we need people who will, suffer, who will step up and help to role model very different and effective concepts of leadership. Uh, so I wish you the best of luck as you make yourselves and your schools into better leaders, and thank you very much.